Yay. Okay, welcome to lecture two. It's a DSP lecture. We'll be doing some math and looking at waveforms. Get excited. Um, so I'm going to start out with some context of where we are in the big picture of RAP. So last lecture was a year talked about uh, analog circuits. Can you see that? Yeah. So within the big communication system that we have, um, he was talking about how to get our one megahertz signal. Can you see from that far? One megahertz signal? I'm turning the lights off. To, a little easier. I don't know. Do you want to try yeah, that? Yeah, let's see the lights. Like that. So what we're so what all the hardware does is it gets is that our Yeah, that's good. No, okay, no, 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 no. no. Okay. <laughs> it takes on. our one megahertz signal, uh, converts it to 27 megahertz, and then the down conversion PCB, and then, okay, so basically our MCU um, can generate a signal at one megahertz, but we need to transmit um, at 27 megahertz because that's the bandwidth that the FCC gives us. Um, so what Zaire did, it's like teaching you how to do this hardware, this up conversion from one megahertz to 27 megahertz, and then on the receiver side, 27 megahertz back to one megahertz. Uh, but we're, what we're gonna be doing today is starting from um, the beginning, the beginning. So going from like, oh, we have a bunch of bits. How are we going to translate that onto um, a wave? that can then be uh, converted to 27 megahertz and transmitted. So we're gonna be working in these areas today. Um, yeah, and hopefully you will get a sense of what it means to encode digital bits, like ones and zeros, onto a sinusoid. Um, yeah, cool. So, the main topic for today is going to be what's called BPSK modulation. You can think of modulation as the way that we encode these binary bits onto some sinusoid. Um, and if you think of how to do this, like it seems a little bit strange that you would be able to just put these like random, or not random, you'd be able to put just these numbers onto an, a, a sinusoid. Um, but if you think about it, like the way that we do it is actually somewhat intuitive. So the first thing that actually, yeah, no, I'll say this. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do, so say we want to transmit this string of bits. Um, the first thing that we're gonna do is represent these bits as like what's called time shifted delta functions. So. Do we know what a delta function is? Do we know what, oh my goodness, what is it called? A Kronecker delta is. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Dirac delta is the one where it has uh, like infinite area, so, something. Oh, it goes to infinity C, yeah. at one point, um, but Kronecker deltas are much easier to deal with because they, they're just one at one point and then there's zero everywhere else. Um, but what we're gonna do is take uh, the like ones and zeros, and we're gonna say like, oh, maybe uh, we can assign a one to a positive one Kronecker delta, so like this. And then if the next bit is also a one, we'll have the next Kronecker delta also a one. And then if we have a zero, we'll have a Kronecker delta at a negative one. Um, and note that this is a function of time. So now we have our like, just like bits with no t sense of time to something that is starting to look like a waveform. So this is progress. Um, but what's missing here? There's no sinusoid part. We need a sinusoid part. Okay, so what should we do now? So we have, um, we want to work with sinusoids. So can someone tell me what our, okay, wait. We want to work with sinusoids and we want to assign a certain waveform to bit zero and a certain waveform to bit one. Any 
any ideas on how to do this? Um, I'll say, like, what are the two main aspects of a sinusoid? Like, when they teach you about sines and cosines, like, how are they, how, you, how can you make them different? Yes? Uh, phase and frequency? Or like yeah, phase and frequency are two. There is one other one that I'm looking for. Starts with an A. Amplitude. Yeah. Cool. So these are the three sort of like aspects of sinusoids that we can play with in order to create a waveform for zero that looks very different than the waveform for one. Um, and any thoughts on why we want the waveform for zero to look very different than the waveform from one? This is like pretty intuitive. Is that here? Well, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was talking to someone. I think they're locked outside. Um, so, you know, you probably want two distinct shapes here, right? Two different yeah. shapes two. So I don't know what kind of comes to mind is maybe like a sine, cosine, or maybe like a sine, and then just take the opposite, right? So you yes. It. Okay. Okay. Wait. Too much. Too, too much, much. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So the thing is, like, on so like the wave that we transmit, like when it travels through the air, it's gonna pick out some random noise. And so what we want to do is we want to transmit, we want the wave that we transmit to be as clear as possible about what's a zero and what's a one, so that when the receiver gets the, the signal, it's able to sort of like still, see, still recover the original bits, even with that added noise. So anyway, back to uh, what we should assign to zero versus a one. Um, there's like two kind of simplest um, cases of like how this is done. So one is just, actually I might have, I kind of wanted to show this slide for this. Um, yeah, I think I would just show this slide for this. Uh, no, okay, I, I think I'll just write it out. Okay, so. Uh, we have our generic equation for a sinusoid. I'll just use cosine here. Cosine F C T plus theta um, is the amplitude, and then F C is something called the carrier frequency. We'll get back to that. And then theta is the phase. Um, so one thing that we can do is have the the bit cor the waveform corresponding to zero have um, a phase offset of zero degrees. So um, we'll do like a equals. We'll have both of the waves have amplitude of one, and for the zero, we'll have a phase offset of zero degrees but for the one, we'll have a phase offset of 180 degrees. So what that might look like is for the same uh, time period T, maybe we'll have uh, a waveform that's, let's see, uh, not very good at drawing things. I feel like I'm gonna draw this and it's like not gonna make much sense. But I will do my best. So it's like that. And then the one course the waveform corresponding to a one might look something like this. So you can see that these two waveforms are 180 degrees out of phase. So that's pretty good. That's pretty neat. Um, another thing that you can do, so that's called phase shift keying. You can see that this is drawn much better. Um, so like the waveform corresponding to a one, like first it goes up and then down, but then the waveform corresponding to a zero go, first goes down and then up. Um, yeah. Any thoughts so far? Cool. Um, so that's phase shift keying, which is what we're going to use for wrap. 
There's also other ways of assigning um, symbols, or there's other ways of assigning waveforms to uh, particular bits. Um, like notably, another way is amplitude shift keying. So for a bit of one, maybe you'll send uh, a sinusoid with an amplitude of one. So it's just like a sinusoid. But for a zero, you'll send one. You'll send a, a waveform with amplitude of zero, so it'll just be nothing. Um, and then similarly for frequency shift keying, uh, you can like have one uh, one bit have higher frequency and another bit have much lower frequency. Cool. So another one thing that we wanted to like one of our main goals for figuring out what waveform to assign to the bits is that we want the waveforms to look very different from each other. Um, and so, let's see. So we want a way to measure how different the zero waveform is from the one waveform. Um, Cause like, in this case, we can say like, oh, uh, like, uh, like having a zero degree offset waveform is very different from 180 degree. Like you wouldn't want to do a zero degree waveform versus a 90 degree waveform because like those aren't as different, you know. And similarly with amplitude shift keying, it'd probably be a good idea to do like a very large number for the amplitude corresponding to the one bit waveform, and then like a very small number, oh, that's the same, a very small number for the amplitude corresponding to the other, um, to the zero waveform. But we want a way to like really like quantitatively know um, how like far apart how like different our zero waveform is from our one waveform. Um, and the way that we can do that is um, use this like, is plot our waveforms on what's called a constellation diagram. And a constellation diagram, you can think of it like a phasor diagram where um, like, so it's just gonna be this, 2D plane where the x-axis um, is like, this is the real component, y-axis is the imaginary component. Um, and if you think about our waveforms, waveform corresponding to a zero um, has amplitude one and phase of zero. So it's like this. Okay. Okay. Any thoughts on like actually I'll I'll just I'll I'll tell y'all this one. So um for the bit called zero, if we plotted it on this constellation diagram, um, it would have, it would be a, it'd be a vector like this. So, uh, or let me actually, one, one. Um, amplitude one, phase zero. And then for our other waveform, it would be amplitude one, but phase 180 degrees. So it looked like that. And then typically, instead of drawing the vector, we just draw the, like, we just draw the point. So our constellation diagram um, for this, these two phase shift uh, waveforms would look like this. Um, and this is called, since we have two waveforms, we call this um, binary phase shift. Yeah. 
and it's binary because we have one phase shift assigned to zero and another phase shift <coughs> assigned to one uh, phase shift because that's how we differentiate between the waveforms and it's like keying you can think of it as like oh like the zero is corresponding to this one and the one anyway <laughs> okay any questions so far does everyone know like what a phaser diagram is Cool. So, okay, what do we have so far? We have we have a bunch of bits that we want to transmit, and we're like, okay, like we'll give them some notion of time so we can represent them as time, but we want to get this to we want to basically put our like these sinusoids at each position of the deltas. Now, if you've taken 102 recently, you might know a handy property for doing this. What happens when you convolve with a delta, with a time-shifted delta? Yeah. Oh, raise your hand. Oh my god. Anyone? Oh, my Tomoy is yelling at all of you. Tomoy is <laughs> Tomoy is screaming. Yes, go ahead, um, Patrick. So if you convolve a with the time shifted delta, you just get that thing back, but time shifted. Right? Yes, yes, which is what we want in this case, right? Because so, because we want to have okay. <coughs> yeah, no, we're chilling, we're chilling. So we want to. So what we're gonna do is like with our deltas, which kind of look like this diagram draws the bits differently, but. We want to convolve our. Uh, we want to convolve our symbol, our waveforms for each uh, bit onto our delta train. Um, so then, cool. We get, and uh, this is how we do it for phase shift keying. Um, this is just another example of how it's done for amplitude shift keying. Um, so yeah, cool. So now we have a, um, a waveform that encodes our ones and zeros over time. Cool. So are we done yet? Any thoughts? No. <laughs> Uh, the next thing that we're going to need to think about is um, how to take this signal um, and convert it to a higher frequency. So, um, actually, before I talk about that, so I want to... So we have this like general idea of what the waveform should look like, but I want to take a second to talk about how um, how the math is actually going to represent this symbol. Like, what are the numbers that we're going to use? Um, so for that, uh, so if you recall, we have our generic. Um, equation for a sinusoid. Um, um, and note that the amplitude is a function of time and the phase is a function of time because we're modulating the amplitude and phase depending on whether we're sending a zero or a one bit. And we basically want a way to um, isolate the amplitude from the, well, we want a way to look at how the amplitude is being modulated and how the phase is being modulated um, and note that FC. Um, and do, do, do. 
And the thing is, like, this, like, we want a way to just see how the amplitude is changing and how the phase is changing without having to deal with this carrier frequency, this like 27 megahertz. Um, because this 27 megahertz, like it doesn't tell us any information about what we're sending. Um, all it does is just like allow us to send the signal. Um, so the way that we're going to um, get this A of T and this theta of T out is use some fun trig identities. Um, so, so this X of T can be written as NT. where we used back to the way that we look at constellation diagrams with the um, the like can do is well also you can also think of the x-axis as being what's called the in phase component and the y-axis being what's called the quadrature component um, and this is for the total sinusoid um, and then in order to mathematically break up our sinusoid into the in phase and quadrature component, so we've applied this trig identity right here, and um, we're going to define the in phase component as this A of T cosine theta of T, and the quadrature component as this a of t sine theta of t. And now note that the in phase component, which I'll denote as i of t, and the quadrature component, which I'll denote as q of t, these no longer take into account this omega naught, which is what we want, because the omega naught doesn't actually contain any information about what is about what's a one or what's a zero. Yay, okay. Um, and then, so we can also write x of t So we can also, let's see. Uh, we can also write x of t as the in phase component times cosine of mega naught t plus the quadrature component times sine of the mega t. Cool. Uh, yeah. And then I'm going to 
and talk a bit more, or any questions thus far? We're chilling. Jax is smiling at me. <coughs> I think this last part is a bit confusing, but I'm going to explain it some more now. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a bit more about what it means to be able to just like ignore this, uh, to ignore this carrier frequency um, component of the wave because it doesn't give us any actual information. Um, and with that, um, we're going to look at the, um, the frequency spectrum of our signal. So our signal um, operates at around a carrier frequency of 27 megahertz, and maybe it looks something like this. And we know that since our signal is real, um, its frequency spectrum will be symmetric about the y-axis, so we'll have something like this. Um, and the thing is, like, if you remember, um, the, in order to recover the original signal, um, there's something called the Nyquist rate, where you need to sample at at least two times the maximum frequency that you send. Um, so in this case, two times the maximum frequency that we send is, like, quite a large number. And the thing is, that's a lot of compute power. And honestly, it's like not very good use because all of this frequency range isn't even being used. Um, so that's the motivation for thinking about uh, our signal just centered at uh, zero frequency. So basically, we want to have a way to just like bring our signal, or at least analyze our signal, just in centered around DC. And we call the like we call the signal at excuse me. We call the signal. Uh, at 27 hertz, the passband signal. And the one at DC, the baseband equivalent signal. Um, yeah, and it's just a handy way to be able to um, analyze the signal without dealing with this extra frequency. Um, yeah. And then just to give a more concrete connection between um, X of T and uh, and this phaser notation, um, what we can do uh, is looking at the constellation diagram.
think of our x of t as this rotating vector where um, it's rotating at a speed of 2 pi fc um, and it has this amplitude and phase. Um, yeah, so the magnitude of x is a and the phase of x is theta. And then sense so far? Okay. And then at the received, so that was quadrature modulation. Or, oh wait, and then I have this other illustration for base band versus pass band. So if you have <coughs> this sequence of bits, um, we're going, you can either have a, we can either show the pass band um, signal, and if you think of it in terms of baseband, this is what the signal looks like. So you can see that the passband signal is just at a higher frequency than the baseband signal, but the information that they encode is the same. So we talked about quadrature modulation, and we also need to talk about quadrature demodulation. So demodul quadrature demodulation is going to be how the receiver um, is able to recover that original a of t and theta of t to know um, to know what uh, what signal was actually sent. So. At the receiver end, um, we want some way to go from this like to go from this signal where we don't actually know the um, in phase and quadrature components. And we want some way to recover the I of T and the Q of T so that um, we can plot um, or you can think of it as the I and the Q um, so we can hopefully recover the original um, the original waveforms and know the bits that were sent so the way that we can recover this I of t, and recall that I of t equals I have to define the in phase component as um, A of t times cosine of t. So we want to get um, these i of t and q of t from the translated x of t. So what we can do is a fun trick where in order to get the i of t, um, we're going to multiply x of t by cosine um, omega naught t. And what we're okay, and then what we have also we can also write the received signal as um, I of T cosine omega naught T minus Q T.
So we want a way to recover just the I of T and the Q of T. We don't really, we don't care about this omega naught. So the way that we're gonna do that is multiply X of T. But so, okay. First, in order to get the in phase component, we're going to multiply X of T by cosine um, omega naught T. You might be like, what good is this gonna do? But we have some trig identities that will help us out. Um, and once we multiply I of T or once we multiply X of T by cosine omega naught T, what we get is I of T cosine squared omega naught T minus Q of T cosine omega naught T sine omega naught T. Cool. What good does this do for us? Well, there's this handy trig identity um, that we can use, and that is cosine squared of x equals one half times x. So we're gonna apply that here, and what we get this help us? Well, I'm going to write this out a bit more. Cool. So, um, what we notice is that, so we want to just keep this I of T term. We can multiply it by two and then we'll get I of T. Um, so that's pretty simple. But the thing is, uh, like how are we gonna get rid of these two parts of the wave? Um, and what you'll notice is that very conveniently, um, these two terms are at a much higher frequency. They're at two times omega naught. Um, and is there any signal processing technique that we know that will get rid of signals at um, a high frequency. Uh, some sort of filter? Yeah, we can low pass filter. And after applying the low pass filter and then multiplying by two, we can recover I of T. Yay! Okay. And then we're going to perform a similar exercise for Q of T. I'm not going to go through it all, but. Um, Basically, if we multiply x of t by negative sine of omega naught t, um, apply some trig identities, low pass filter, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. and then we can recover q of t. And then from our i of t and q of t, how do we find our a of t and theta of t? So, here again, we're just going to do a bit more math. Um, so we have that, so if you remember how we defined i of t and q of t, um, the, what we can do 
is in order to get to recover our a of t, um, we can take the square root of i of t squared plus u of t squared. So that'll give us the magnitude of that rotating vector. And then similarly, to get the phase, we can take the arctangent of the quadrature component over the in phase component. Yay! And note again that these, this a of t and theta of t don't depend on whatever carrier frequency fc that we used. Cool. So looking at time, there's one more thing that we need to figure out. Um, and it's what we kind of glossed over at the beginning. Um, it's how to get um, how to um, get the like get the best waveforms assigned to zero and one. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But first, I want to give y'all a break. So. Yeah, five minutes on the clock, you can chat with each other. Oh, uh, yeah, it's true, you got it wrong, you can't do it. If you want to do it now, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, sure. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we didn't do the straight out of wrong teen rap uh, last <laughs> time, so we're going to do it right now. Oh, yeah, I need to find the entire lyrics first. Uh, <laughs> I, I tried to use the impact of some more Yeah, he's like, I for this and reading Okay, uh, yeah. right, should I start? Go for it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, you are now about to witness the strength of spice knowledge. Straight out of Rompton, crazy I triple A project lead name. Well, it's actually a crazy motherfucker named Nathan, but, you know, uh, from a game called Rap Leads with Education, when I'm called off, I get my spice off, hit simulate, and my fans take off. YouTube boy, if you fuck with me, the FCC is going to have to come and get me off your ass. It's time going out from the punk project members that are showing out. Rap kids start to mumble, they want to rumble, mix them and cook them in a pot like gumbo. Going off on a project lead like that with a Nintendo that's pointing right at you. Uh, yo ass, so give it up smooth. Ain't no telling that I'm down for a jack move. Here's a murder rap to keep you splicing with an FCC record like Max Headroom. Spectrum Analyzer is a tool, don't make me act a motherfucking fool. Me, you can go toe to toe, no maybe. I'm dropping rap kids out of the project daily. Hopefully that's not, hopefully that's not any of you guys. Uh, yo, weekly, monthly, yearly, till these dumb motherfuckers see clearly that I'm down with the capital LCR boy. You can't fuck with me, so when I'm in your lab, you better duck, because Nathan is crazy as fuck as I leave. believe I'm stomping, but when I come back, boy, I'm cutting straight out of Rompton. Uh, wait, there's more, by the way. Uh, yo, Rompton, what's up? Tell them where you're from. Straight out of Rompton, another crazy-ass figure. More sims I run, yo, my signal gets bigger. I'm a smart motherfucker, and you know this, but if us get rap kids don't show this, if I don't give a fuck, I'm gonna make my amps if not... Wait, let's see. Wait, is this... <laughs> oh, I know, yeah, yeah, this this one is uh, the right the right one. Uh, but the fussy-ass rap kids don't show this, but I don't give a fuck, I'm gonna make my amp. If not from the sisters, from blasting the bands, just like my diodes, the definition is switching, and when adding frequency, it's called mixing. Uh, make an oscillator in a minute, I find a good ISM band, I go up in it. Uh, if you got a radio in the front row, I'm, I'm gonna send you a bunch of message of packets, ho. So, uh, you probably like get it if the board. Well, it's, you'll probably get it like the board is supposed to, but it shows my channel's composed to a crazy BTSK for a bit. Add it to legit because I'm coding shit. MCU controls the SRC for any motherfucker that codes the SP. With transformers, I'm winding myself every time I pull a tool or weight off the shelf. The insertion loss is minimum and Q's nifty. OHM smells ohm and it's 50. See, because I got motherfucking transforms, the definition is clear. You're the witness of the waveforms. Uh, that's taking place without a line, and when you're on a scope, signal is sign. Uh, look, you might take it as a trip, but a lead like me is doing without chips straight out of Rompton. 
Okay, well, there's more, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David is his name in this guy's comment. Straight out of Rompton is the brother that'll solder your wire, make all the heat guns misfire, dangerous voltage spikes on a rail, and if I ever fry a bore, I make bail. Uh, see, I don't give a fuck, that's a problem. I see a project number fail, I sabotage them. Uh, but I'm smart at the way street a while, and when the oscillator blows, I smile. Uh, to me, it's kind of funny, the attitude shown, kid debugging. But don't know where the current going, just flow and look, looking for the one they call rap leads but on a camouflage, no one succeeds. Ruthless, never see a message in the air, except when I lecture, you'll see KBL without hesitation, and you'll hear stream of those of the ones who lost their motivation. Give me a nano V and A and I'm catching every single network that isn't matching. What about the batteries that ain't charged? Fuck them. You think I give a damn about DC? I ain't a sucker. This is the autobiography of a lead. If you ever fuck with me, you'll get taken by a stupid dope lead who will solder a caps your grandmother straight out of Rompton. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, I'm going to make them in the past. <laughs> so, yeah, there's the also the uh, WAP uh, remix for uh, this. Maybe <laughs> another day. Yeah, maybe another day. Yeah, it would have been funny if David Bomb named it the Wireless and Analog Project. <laughs> that would be extremely funny. That would be hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, also, my name is Alexi Samoyalov, by the way. Yeah. I'm sure it is Alexi Samoyalov. The best E3 tutor. Yeah. Every time someone asks me about uh, E3, I just tell them uh, you should take it with Alexi Samoyalov as her TA. The TA? No, it's about E3. E3 is about the risk card class? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, well, you know, guys. Alexi Samoyalov. I'm pretty sure most of you guys have already taken it, but uh, if you do need to take it, you should take it with Alexi Samoyloff, who is very based on Red Pill. Anyone have any questions on what was just covered while we're on the break? Jackie? What? Any questions? No questions. Smiling a lot. I, I'd like to add that this was written before Alexi stopped swearing or something, so. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I want to clarify um, I think I might have read, I, hopefully I wrote it down, but um, the in phase component is defined um, like the in phase component is like the x component. Uh, of the wave and the quadrature component is like the y component. And I of t. So that's why we have that arc tangent relation for the overall phase and the like Pythagorean theorem equation for the magnitude of the sinusoid. What's the equation for I of t in terms of the uh, low pass filter? And Q of t. It's a whole thing. Yeah. So when we derived No, where did we derive it? <laughs> like one slide above this? One slide above it? No wait. It happened. It I did swear happen. It happened, but now it's No, it's gone. further down. More Yes. Here you go. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, after we low pass the Wait, what's your question? Like I of T equals like two times like LPF of like X of T. Oh. Yeah. Okay. The closed form. Uh, I just like think about it as like you know, LPF this and then it goes away. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. Same thing, yeah. Yes, Patrick. 
would it just be us multiplying it by a sink or something to get to LP after? To get to? To low pass it. To low pass it. Because I remember like um, sync is like box car. Sync in time mm -hmm. and reckon. Yeah. yeah. And like yeah. vice versa. Mm -hmm. kind of. We're going to show like the type of filters we use for low pass. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That is uh, coming up. But for now, um, Um, okay. So far, we have this sort of, um, we have these two representations mm -hmm. of the signal that we're going to send. Um, and the thing is that um, we need to, um, like, when we convolve, um, the delta train with uh, whatever our waveform for zero or one is. Um, there's this thing about uh, like transmitting a symbol or there's this thing about let, let me let me let me draw something first. <laughs> So if we draw our communication system, we start out with some S of T, which we can denote as these uh, Kronecker deltas. So like, maybe this is corresponding to a one, zero, one, this is time. Um, we're going to send that through this H of T, and this is going to be um, the filter that, um, like, basically puts our symbols corresponding to Just another, we'll call it H of C. Um, and this is just like where noise is. Uh, uh, this is just like going to be where noise is introduced into um, our signal. So I'll just call it. Um, actually, I think for the sake of keeping things 
times with the same notation, um, I'm going to write out, uh, okay, actually, yeah, no, scratch this. I'm going to, I'm going to stick to um, how things are, like, typically represented. Um, so the thing is, like, when you're sending a continuous stream of bits, you basically, like, need a way to distinguish from where one bit ends and another bit starts. And like a way that you can do that is by uh, like sending your signal by like convolving with a rect function. So maybe it has a period t. Um, and so that, that's one way to like be able to distinguish. And there's also going to be this, um, I believe this is the sending channel um, filter, and then noise gets added, just like random uh, noise gets <coughs> added in the channel, and then there's this um, Uh, there's this, we can model the signal being received as um, by this other box. Um, and then once that signal gets uh, received, um, we want to sample that received signal at a rate equals kt, where t is the sampling period. Um, and then that will get us our received, um, our received symbols. And then what we do is we can have this comparator that gets us our original bits. And if you remember, the comparator is because we have our bits, like our constellation diagram, where bits like over here are we call it zero, and over here uh, we call one. So, like, what we're comparing is if they're on the right side of. Uh, <coughs> the IQ plane, we assume it's a zero. If they're on the left side of the IQ plane, we assume it's a one. And then also to just like go on a, a little bit of a tangent, if we have noise in our channel, um, so like this is the ideal case for um, the constellation diagram that we would receive. But the thing is, like, because of this noise in our channel, what we often receive looks more like kind of a blob of bits, where because of this random noise, there's like these random phase offsets. So like moving the points like around and then also um, changes in amplitude, which moves the points like either closer to the zero zero point or away from it. So that's just, a, yeah. So basically, we hope that uh, by doing this comparison, we're able to still know whether like bits are able to still know correctly recover the zeros and the ones by just doing this comparison of like which side of the IQ plane are they on. But quick tangent. So back to this. Um, so uh, if we So if we 
you write the received signal y of t, um, you know that since this is just like a block diagram, um, we can write y of t as um, the uh, or I'm going to write this in I think I'm actually just going to write this in the frequency domain. So the um, the received signal is like actually I should start from the beginning. Okay, so um, <coughs> actually just to keep things simple. Um, at a, I think at a higher level, I'll just say that um, separating out the symbols using this rect function is not a good idea because um, anyone remember what the Fourier transform of a rect function is? A sink. Yeah. And anyone remember the uh, bandwidth of a sync function? Infinity. <laughs> there, oh wait, also I drew sync squared, my bad. So the thing is, we don't have um, this infinite bandwidth. So that's the reason why we can't use this rect function. Um, and what we use instead is um, something that is similar to a sync function in time, but is slightly different. Or actually, let me first explain the reason why we have to um, deal with this, like, symbols, uh, like, this, like, how to distinguish between the start of one bit and the start of the next bit. Um, so consider if you have, um, if you're just sending a bit of one, um, and if you look at the pulse that you send in time, it's just like, it's just chilling. Um, uh, and like, if you don't send any other bits or like you just send a one and then zeros, um, you're still like, and you, your receiver is sampling at these time steps, you're still able to recover the one bit here. Um, but you can see that like the symbols start, okay, yeah, and then, but you can see that if you try to send multiple, uh, multiple like changing bits one after another, um, because of these different filters that your sig that your signal goes through, um, what you get is this like smearing, um, which we call intersymbol interference. And then when you add these, and then like what your receiver sees is the sum of all of these symbols or of all of these pulses. And like you can see, it's like aliasing. You, you're unable to distinguish like what, uh, which parts of um, like at each time step, like which parts of the given uh, bit waveform were sent. Um, so. <laughs> Going back to what shape we're going
going to actually use to implement um, this like division between the bits. Um, we're going to use something called um, a let me see if I have this slide. Yeah, a raised cosine function. And the thing that we like about the raised cosine function is that its frequency response is limited, or its bandwidth is limited, and then also with respect to time, the, um, although there is like, although there are uh, like additional, like non-zero parts of it, like at positions other than zero, um, at every interval of t, which is the sampling period, it's zero. So what this does for us is that at each sampling point that we care about, like at each point where we're actually looking for um, a corresponding bit, this, uh, cosi this raised cosine function is not going to, like this raised cosine function will give us the, um, will like maintain the, the waveform that we want to look at, but it won't look at, it won't mess with the, um, the bits around, or the, the, the bit waveforms around it. Um, and because of this limited bandwidth, we can, we can feasibly, um, we can feasibly implement a, a raised cosine solution. And then, is uh, raised cosine the same thing as sync? So yeah, that's a good question. Raised cosine is very similar to sync. You see, it, it kind of looks like a sync. Um, but the sync function actually, if I plotted it here, <coughs> it looks like um, it's a bit like, Batter. <laughs> um, it's a bit sharper. Um, and so the reason why we don't like the sink as much is that it goes back to um, the thing about noise in the system because ideally we would sample at every t seconds and that would give us um, exactly the the point where, uh, like, the bit value <laughs> uh, is like str strongest, I guess. But the thing is, like, sometimes we were not able to sample at exactly t. So if we used the sync function, the, and like we let's say we were kind of like offset from t by a little bit, then we would sample it up here or down here. Um, and because the slope of the sync function is much steeper at each t interval, this would um, this would basically like produce more of that smearing, as opposed to the lesser slope of the raised cosine function, um, which like gives us allows us a bit more leeway in terms of. Um, sampling at exactly t. And remember that there's a lot of like background knowledge that I've kind of glossed over, but just trust like <laughs> uh, <laughs> every <laughs> uh, like <laughs> just just trust for now. <laughs> uh, like we want the we want to like keep the waveform at its maximum, like, what, like, just for us for now. <laughs> okay. Grace, I have a question. Yeah. Um, could you draw, like, if you, if you have two uh, raised cosines next to each other, one interval t apart, and how yeah. the zeros don't add up? Yeah. yeah. So, I, this is really hard to draw, <laughs> but I can, um... You'd, like, trace over... The one that's there and just kind of move. I can, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
so you can see that at every t interval, like, so say that this pulse, this new pulse that I drew corresponds to the, um, the next <coughs> bit. Um, it's time domain thing um, is not going to interfere with the pulse from the previous bit because at each sampling point uh, T, like when we add these waves together, um, they're not when you add them together, but <laughs> the like when we sample at T equals zero, for example, and we're adding, wh what we're doing is we're just adding the value of the, the first pulse, which is what we want. And the contribution from the second pulse is zero. Cool. I'll, I'll link uh, a photo that shows this better than my little drawing. Um, yeah. And then there's also this, I guess, theorem in communication systems where in order to uh, maximize what's called your signal to noise ratio um, for your system. Um, you want to have um, this transmitter thing. So we're having, so instead of having this rect as what we convolve our signal with, we're going to have a uh, we're going to have a raised cosine. Um, but the thing is, so this is our transmit. We'll call it our trans. Transmit filter. And over here is our receiver filter. Um, in order to maximize what's called our signal to noise ratio, um, it's been shown that we actually want the um, transmit filter to be the same or to match the receiver filter. And what we can do is um, instead of sending and like overall, we want to use this raised cosine, but since we have um, this overall uh, <coughs> this overall system that includes both the uh, transmit filter and the receive filter, um, is instead of sending a raised cosine at the transmitter and just like kind of doing nothing at the receiver. Um, what we do instead is we have a, what's called a root raised cosine at the transmitter and the same thing at the receiver. So that overall, um, we have this raised cosine and the root raised cosine is literally just the Raise cosine is literally just the square root of the raised cosine. Um, so yeah, and then putting everything together. <coughs> you see that decently? You can kind of see it decently. Um, First, we have our bits, which we're just going to represent as time shifted delta, delta, Kronecker deltas. And then when we convolve with the um, raised cosine at the transmitter, um, we get, we get this like, red curve 
which like is quite small and we're not really going to worry about. But the thing, is, the important thing is that overall, once we finish modulating, we get this orange curve, which, um, as you, if you can see it, the cool thing about this this wave, which is what we originally send, is that if you note, <coughs> if you notice, um, is it's like, because like what we could have done is sent like it's like the the lowest frequency like envelope of all of the delta, um, all the like shifted deltas, um, because like what we could have done is enveloped the um, the deltas just like with a rect function. So we could have like gone like that, for example, to enclose all of the deltas. But the thing is, we really don't like square waves because if you remember to represent a square wave in the frequency domain, you literally need infinite bandwidth. So the cool thing about this like square root raised cosine approach is that like you're able to include the um, you're able to like include each of the like at each sampling period um, this function like keeps the full value of the delta and at the same time like at any other value like that's when we uh, decide not to like use as much frequency um, yeah so anyway <laughs> that is all I had for y'all today um, thanks for bearing with me with all the like trying to figure out how to explain this well um, I I think I mainly just like pulled from a bunch of different sources, so I ended up with this like Frankenstein of a lecture. Um, but what I'll do is I'll provide some some good YouTube videos that will be more cohesive than than what this was. Um, yeah. As any closing announcements say here, are we good? Yeah, I guess I can speak as to like the tricky part of communication is like this is normally like we have a separate class for this, you know. Uh -huh. So it's like. Don't expect to get everything the first try because it's like it's quite a bit. It's something you'll you know bang your head against the wall with, and eventually it'll make sense. And like, why does it make sense? You don't really know, but it just makes sense. So yeah, don't stress about it too much. It's quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess other than that, the our first wrap work session is Sunday noon to four in the IEEE lab. If you need to finish the um, if you need to finish module one, that's a good time to do it. If you want to start module two, also a good time to do it. Um, yeah, can I get a show of hands, like who plans on going to the work session, just tentatively? Hell yeah, okay, it'll be a good time. Unfortunately, we don't have budget to like buy cookies or something, but I might bring something myself because I love my, my team members. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks y'all, yeah. have a good, have a good day. Yeah. One last thing before everyone leaves. Um, if you know someone who's not done a deposit or has done it, it needs to send to you. Let them know, please. Uh, that'd be great. And also, uh, David Bond's video on YouTube, very good for helping get started with LT Spice. LT Spice setup is the most on module one. So if you can watch that video, I'm going to get set up on Sunday and I'll see if I can do the same thing. I'll see if I can do the same thing. So you're, I'll see you in the lab later. Yeah. Oh. 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 Oh.